Okay, we've been on a journey from from January. We've been journeying with <clears throat> Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha hasn't done anything so far. Elisha cannot do anything so far until the ministry of Elijah is complete. Elisha asks only one thing from Elijah. He asks for a double portion of his spirit. And when he asks for a double portion of the spirit, Elijah's answer is that you have asked for a hard thing. He tells him you have asked for a hard thing. Why did Elijah ask for a hard thing? Say it was a hard thing that you have asked for. What is that of Elijah? Why is it so difficult to receive that spirit of Elijah? And I was working and working and I'm learning new things each week. And I'm excited as I work and I see almost like when I began this year in January and the Lord directed to me to this portion and then the second week we started on the book of Revelation. I didn't realize it was going to be almost like a parallel study. And I had no idea. Now as I study Elijah's and Elisha's journey and as we are studying the book of Revelation, we see all of us are learning about the double portion. So today we are not looking at the harvest. We are going to look at gleaning. You know there is a difference between harvest and gleaning? Harvest is very easy because you see, the gleaners are the ones who come after the harvesters and you have to glean it by hand. And it's a difficult job. Okay. The reason I'm saying is that today we are going to look at Elijah. We're not going to look at Bedel or Gilgal or Jericho or I. Today the Lord is directing us to Elijah. And the fact is, in the past few years, we have looked at Elijah a couple of times. And what we looked at that time was more like the harvest. Today we are going to glean Elijah. And you know what? Maybe for some of you or most of you, like it was for me, everything I learned about Elijah in this study was new. And it opened my eyes to why God told Elisha, you have asked for a hard thing. What does the word Eli mean? Think, think, think. Christians, think. Why did Jesus cry out on the cross? Eli, Eli, Lava. What does Eli mean? God, my God. Eli means my God. Jah is the short form of Jehovah. His name Elijah means my God, Jehovah. My God, Jehovah is what his name means. And Elisha is not going to get the double portion of the anointing as long as he, if he takes his eyes off my God Jehovah, he's not going to get the double portion. If he wants the double portion, he has to keep his eyes on his God Jehovah till the last moment. And you will see so many of them falling away, so many of them falling away, including the sons of the prophet. And only Elisha receives the double portion. And what's strange about Elijah is, we do not know anything about Elijah. Until he appears onto the scene. When we meet Elisha, we get to know who his father is, what his profession is. We find him in the field. He's plowing the field. We know a whole lot about what Elisha is. But when Elijah enters into the scene, in the book of Kings, all we know is Elijah the Tishbite. Nobody knows who his father is. Nobody knows who his mother is. Nobody knows anything about his family. Nobody knows anything what he did before God called him out. Elijah just appeared onto the scene. And every time Elijah appears onto the scene, it seems like it is the same. Because in the book, Gospel according to Matthew, when the next one who comes in the anointing of Elijah comes, it suddenly comes saying, he came out of the wilderness. Preaching the, 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 the 
the sermon on repentance. Elijah has no father, no mother, or no occupation until he is called. Meaning, Elijah is a picture of those who have died in Christ. They have no identity. They have no identity. The picture of Christ, they have no identity other than the identity which God gives them. Thirty times he is mentioned in the New Testament. Elijah is mentioned thirty times in the New Testament and scripture also, if you look in your song sheet on the verse, it says, Elijah was a man just like us. In James chapter 5 verse 17 says, Elijah was a man subject to passion as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not, it rained not on earth by the space of three years and six months. He was a man just like us. But what made him different? What made him different was that he had no identity. He had no identity at all. That's the call of Elijah. When Elisha is asking, I want a double portion of your spirit, you have to start the journey with Elijah. And you know when they started that journey together, there was a problem. There was a problem in the beginning when they started the journey. Elijah came and put his mantle over Elisha. Elisha knew what the mantle meant and he said, Can I say goodbye to my father and mother? And Elijah said, What do I have to do with you? Elisha gets the message and he does something. He goes back and kills his oxen. And he burns the instruments of the oxen as they are called. The instruments of the oxen are three. The plow, the yoke, and the goad. The goad with which you poke the oxen. The plow, the yoke, and the goad. The plow is what breaks the earth, leaves its mark on the earth. And all those who are not separated unto Christ and dead in Christ always want to make their mark in this world. They are not ready to break their plow. They are not ready to break their plow. Because the plow is that which makes the mark on the earth. And they want a name on this earth. But Elijah says, if you want to make a name in your ministry, you are not worthy to follow me. So he has to break his plow. He's got a yoke on his shoulder. And that yoke has been taking Elisha for years in a direction. That yoke was not from God. Now that yoke has to be broken. The yoke of the enemy has to be broken. Because the enemy who put that yoke on his shoulder also has been poking him and directing his steps. Today all those three have to be burned before you can even speak. Start your journey with Elijah. Are you getting the picture? Yeah. That's how Elisha begins his journey with Elijah. Begins his journey with Elijah. Please don't get carried away by ministries. Big ministries. They have a name and a reputation. Don't get carried away by the mark they make on the earth. Because the final test was the river Jordan. And the 50 sons of the prophet stood on this side of Jordan. They did not cross. Only Elisha crossed. 50 in the Bible in, in Greek means Penta. They represent the Pentecost. There are people who have received the anointing of the Holy Ghost who work in power still will not cross the river of death because they will lose their name and their identity. Only the Elishas will cross. And when the Elishas cross, the first thing they will do before they cross is rip their mantle off saying, I am dead. It's no longer me. It is the mantle of Elijah alone that covers me. I don't have an identity of my own. And then only Elisha can cross the river of death. Because there are so many, you need to realize, anointed by the Holy Ghost who still haven't died to their flesh. Because they want to make their name and their reputation. And often you will see, in spite of incredible manifestation of God's power over their lives, their ministries are named after themselves. 
and not half the daughter. Because they are not willing to rip away the Elisha mantle off to put the Elijah mantle off. Fifty sons of the prophets, they knew what was going to happen. They had the anointing, they knew, they had the word of knowledge, they had the word of discernment, all they had, but they were not willing to cross the river of death. Jordan is the river of death where you die. Yet when the man, Elijah, steps into the picture, he's already dead. He has no identity. He doesn't, we don't know who his father is, whose mother is, what his occupation was, we have no idea at all. And for such a man, when he comes into the picture, the first thing God tells him, go to Ahab. You are ready to face the ruler of this world and fight with him. Now the first thing that we hear about Elijah is, go meet Ahab. You will see it in 1 Kings chapter 17. The first time we hear Elijah, about Elijah, verse 1 is, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years except at my word. Have you heard anything like that before? A man just steps into the picture. You have no name, no record of him before that. There is no record of Elijah in the Bible before that. When he steps forward, he is facing the ruler and he says, this is what God says. This is what God says. The reason Elijah is not speaking for himself because there is no Elijah. He is speaking for God. Because Elijah doesn't have an identity in himself. And the next thing we hear from God to Elijah is verse 3. Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook of Cherith. East is where the sun rises. Turn eastwards means talk about the new day in Christ Jesus. He says, turn Easter, there is a new day in Christ that is coming. A new day of God is coming. I am preparing you for that. Go and hide by the brook. What is the name of the brook? Cherith. And you know what Cherith means? Cherith means cutting or separation. The meaning of the brook, Cherith, is cutting or separation. And God is telling Elijah, I want you to go and be separated from the rest of the world. It's only when you are in the place of separation. When you are hidden in the brook of Cherith, by the brook of Cherith, that God can start ministering to you really about himself. Tells him, go to Cherith and hide there. And what is written next? It's written there. So he went, verse 5, according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into Jordan. And verse 6 says, The ravens brought him bread and meat, flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank from the brook. When you are in the pure place of separation, you will be fed by God. And he shall feed you flesh and bread. The flesh represents God becoming flesh. You will get to know God as flesh. God became flesh. The bread talks about Jesus, the bread from heaven, God and his ways. It's only when you have been separated from the rest, when you have been separated from this world, then will only God start revealing himself to us as God and his ways, represented by the flesh and by bread. He starts revealing. And he will start revealing to you every day, morning and evening, there is a revelation of God that comes to you, even as you drink of the word of God, which is represented by the brook. There is a word of God that is flowing, and you are drinking of that every day, and God is personally ministering to you. And one John will talk about that. You don't need anybody to teach you when you are in that place of separation, because the anointing itself will start teaching you. And there is Elijah separated unto God by the brook chariot and the anointing is feeding him, revealing him and teaching him. And the problem is that even us, all of us, we have this problem is that when God deals with us in a certain manner, we get stuck to a pattern. And even the most Pentecostal of Pentecostals become traditional. So even in the most Pentecostal church, what do we have? We have worship. Testimony, prayer, and word. 
becomes a tradition. It becomes a tradition. And you know what? When it becomes a tradition and when we start putting our faith in that tradition, the brook dries up. The flowing, continuous flowing new revelation of the word stops. Because now we have started putting more trust in the pattern of our worship. Morning it will come, evening it will come, morning it will come, evening it will come, morning it will come, evening it will come, evening, it will come. and after a point of time we are no longer waiting for God, we start waiting for the ravens. <laughs> yeah, who's a raven here right now? It's me. And you don't come to listen to this raven. If you come to listen to this raven, you will realize the brook stops flowing for you. The brook of God's anointing, fresh revelation, stops flowing for you. He didn't say the raven stopped. It only said the brook dried up. And you know what? In so many churches, the brook has dried up. There's no fresh revelation. There is no fresh knowledge of God. There's no fresh teaching. It's still going on because the structure is there and the structure keeps on moving. It's like a big heavy vehicle pushed down the slope. It keeps on moving. And it's just moving. Yet is there a fresh anointing? Is there a fresh revelation? There is nothing fresh happening over there. The word of God has dried up. And the book of Amos warns us of that. In chapter 8 verse 11, the book of Amos warns us of that. Amos comes after Daniel, Hosea and Joel. It says, there is going to be a famine of God's word. Just look at that and mark that in your, in your Bible, children. It's, it's the most terrible famine the world will ever see, if it is not already happening. Chapter 8 and verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst of word, water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. There is a famine coming and there is a famine that has come in so many places. There is a famine that has come where there is no word of God. There are traditions, there are practices, but the word of God has come and God has promised it will happen, a time will come where there will be a famine, where the word of God will not be there. People will run to and fro looking, but they will not find it. But God is still working with Elijah. So when the brook dries up, God hasn't finished with his servant. He's still on that hard road God has called him. And verse 9 of chapter 17. The word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which is in which is in Sidon or Sidon or Sidon. There he says, go to Sidon and in Sidon there is a city called Zarephath. Sidon means hunting. When the brook dries up, when the word dries up, those few who are left who are seeking God will go hunting after God, seeking the word in different places. They will not sit there and say, it is okay, it is fine, as long as the ceremony goes on, I am happy, I am content. There will be a few who will not sit there, they will not sit in chariot, thinking, I am okay, I get my bread and my flesh every day, I am contented. No, there will be a few who will get up and go hunting. They will go hunting and they will come to Sidon hunting and they will reach a city called Zarephath and Zarephath means refining. The name Zarephath means refining. Okay? So Elijah is, goes after God's word. He's brought to a place of refining. And all those who seek God will be brought to Zarephath, a place of refining. And when you come to that place, the state of that nation, the state of that country, and the state of the church is revealed over there. Who is there? There is a widow. There is a widow there. And scripture says the widow had a little boy and it is a poor widow. I am not looking at the parts which I have already taught. I am only showing you the things which we didn't see earlier. The widow is a picture of Israel. 
and a picture of the church. A widow is somebody who has lost her husband. She has no head, no provider, no covering. And Israel at that point has no head, no covering, the anointing has gone. And the church today is in a state where it has no head, no covering, the anointing has gone. Most places where it is known as the church of Jesus Christ, there is no anointing. It's gone. There is a widow. There she is a widow. The Holy Spirit, the Father has left. Her head is uncovered. She has no covering. She is standing over there. But if you were to look into the spiritual reality of those churches, there is no covering. The Father has left. The testimony of she has a son represented by Jesus. But the testimony of her son is so weak. He is little, he is weak and he is dying. The testimony of Jesus in the church is so weak today. Because the church which should bring out the testimony is a widow. And that is where Elijah is sent. And Elijah, the prophet of God, is sent there because Elijah's ministry is the only one which will bring life back to the sun. Unless the Elijah ministry functions, life will not come back to the sun. And Elijah is the one who is sent there because the covering of God is left the woman. When the covering of God goes, remember when the covering of God goes, the woman, the church is naked. Israel is naked. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 32, verse 25. This is when the children of Israel are worshipping the calf. I would request everybody to please either switch off your cell phone or put it on silent mode. Now when Moses saw that the people were un unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame, among their enemies or they were naked to their enemies is what KJV will say you know what when the church start worshipping this world and the things of this world and the ruler of this world in the spiritual realm she loses her covering she is naked and Israel was there naked before God because they were worshipping the God of this world and the church sadly is worshipping the God of this world. And Elijah has been sent there to restore back, to restore, to bring restoration, to come back, to come back, to come back, to call the church to come back. Because you will see that even when Adam and Eve listened to the enemy, the next thing you see was they were uncovered. They lost their covering. The covering which the father had given them was gone and they were naked and they were ashamed. And here is a widow to whom Elijah is sent. And scripture says, the church stands naked and poor. The church has lost its covering and it is poor. The widow is called a poor widow. And in Revelation 3.17, God tells the last day's church, you are poor, you are naked. He says, you are poor, you are naked. You have lost your covering and you are poor. Spiritually, if you had to evaluate, you say, you are poor, you have nothing to show. You have nothing to show. Reason the Father has left. The Holy Spirit anointing has left. There is very little testimony of Jesus and very little of the anointing left. You know why? Because the widow's possession is a handful of flour or meat and a little oil. That's all that is left. When Elijah questions her, she says, I got a handful of atta or flour or meal. Meal is what KJV will use and a little oil. The meal stands for the pure word of God. Later we will see when Elisha is there with the prophets and one of the sons of the prophets goes and gets his wild goats. They are cooking a stew and he cuts it into pieces and puts in the stew and then they cry out there is the smell of death coming out of the stew. Because there will be sons of prophets who will go and cut and hide in the stew false doctrines. And those who have discernment will smell death. And Elisha says, get me a handful of pure meal, pure word of God, which is the only one which can destroy that death. 
And today we are getting it mixed up, mixed up, mixed up, false doctrines all over and people all around are drinking some of this to, to their death. The only thing that can bring restoration is the pure word of God. Jesus talks about the woman who had three measures of meal, pure word of God, into which the living was put. And it messed up the entire word of God. And she says, that's all I have left. A little of the word and a little of the anointing. That's all that is left. Very little. But God says, that very little which you have, that very little which you have, he says, if you bring it and surrender that word and that anointing to the ministry of Elijah, you will be kept alive till the end. Till the rain come back on the land. The rain is talking about the latter rain. There is a pouring of God's spirit that is going to happen. Till that happens, he says, if you take that, hold on to that little word and that little anointing and give it to, bring it under the anointing of Elijah, to the ministry of Elijah, it will sustain you till the latter rain comes. He says, don't waste away, don't consume it yourself. Submit it to the anointing of Elijah. Bring it before the anointing of Elijah. And Elijah says, if you use the little word and the little anointing to serve Elijah, that is, my God, Jehovah. If you use the little word you have and the little anointing you have to serve your God, Jehovah, he says, until the latter rain comes, it will sustain you. And then, something happens. The widow's son dies. The testimony of the son in the church is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and in many many churches the testimony of the son is gone, it's dead. There's no testimony of the son in those churches. If you go over there, the last thing you will see is the son. You will have everybody else. The mother is there, all his brothers are there, the son isn't there. You don't hear about Jesus anywhere there. The testimony of Jesus has died in so many places, so many churches. You need to realize the world who is walking out on the roads don't see us. They don't even know we are a church. They see churches. Lots of statues and ornate carvings and everything over there. And when they go in over there, they never hear about the sun. They hear about a lot of other things. Because the testimony of the sun is gone because the sun is dead. And to bring the sun back to life, Elijah has to do something. Scripture says, he lays himself upon the sun three times. That's it. Three times face to face, he lies upon the sun and then he comes back to life. Three times, brethren, Elijah has to come. Elijah has to bring the sun back to life. The first time that happened was here when the widow's son was brought back to life. Then again he came in the spirit of Elijah. John the Baptist came because the testimony of the son was dead. And he brought back the testimony of the son back. And the book of Malachi says again he will come the third time. Before the son's testimony will arise. Hallelujah. Three times he lay upon the son. You have to prepare ourselves for the ministry of Elijah. Even before we can think about the Elisha ministry. Even before we can think about the Elisha ministry, which is the double portion, we have to prepare for the Elijah ministry. Elijah ministry is bringing a people back to repentance and bringing a people back to God. From all the things of the world that have ensnared us and kept us captive, Elijah ministry separates and brings the people back to God. And that's what Elijah is going to do. He has to deal with, the, with death in that house. And three times Elijah will do it. Three times. The scripture says two is already over. Then the last time, if you look to the last book of the Old Testament and the last verse, you will see it will happen before the dreadful day of the Lord. It is called the last and the dreadful day. The terrible day of the day's judgment is coming. Verse 5 and 6 of chapter 4, the last chapter of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is not talking about John the Baptist. Because Jesus said he is the one who was to come and he is yet to come. Jesus used the same thing in two verses. He says yes he is Elijah who has come. And yet Elijah is yet to come. Because there is one more coming of Elijah left. That will happen meaning that anointing is, is being released. 
The Elijah anointing is being released in the last days, calling people to separate from all these false doctrines, from all these things of the world, and be separated unto God. To be separated unto God. And the Elijah ministry is being released around the world, where you will see people are calling out for repentance now. God is calling out and says, repent and come back, repent and come back, repent and come back, because the day of judgment is very, very close. The dreadful day of this of the Lord is coming where the world is going to be judged and you got no business in that world. Come out, come out and be separated, come out and be separated. And you know what? How do you know? How do you know that the authenticity of the Elijah ministry? Look at what the woman says. Verse 24. The woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. How will you know the Elijah ministry? You will know the Elijah ministry because they will not add or subtract from the truth. She says, I know you are a man of God because the word in your mouth is truth. You are speaking what the word of God says. You are not adding or subtracting from it. That's how you will know the Elijah. You are not, we are not making fanciful doctrines which appeal to the flesh. We are talking the word of God which doesn't appeal to the flesh. And when the word of God doesn't appeal to the flesh, be sure it's always true. When it doesn't appeal to your flesh, you can be very sure it is usually true. That's why it doesn't. Because if it is not true, the flesh will receive it happily. It's not a prosperity gospel, children. It's not a prosperity gospel. This is something that will make your soul prosper. Okay. The word tells us of things of the world that God is telling us to get off. So don't believe when people tell you to get more involved with the world. When God is telling you to separate and come out. You know, the Wednesday thing which you are talking, looking at the book of Revelation. And last week when we did, we looked at the titles of the Holy Spirit and we looked at the titles of Jesus Christ and where that words we didn't come to that on Wednesday where it says thus says the Lord Almighty the term God Almighty is used in the New Testament only ten times and nine of those ten times is in the book of Revelation and only one place in the New Testament other than in the book of Revelation is the revelation of God Almighty given. You know where? It's in the book of Corinthians where God says, separate from them and come to me, touch no unclean, and then you will know me as God Almighty. There's no other place in the New Covenant where God reveals himself to his people as God Almighty because he says, as long as you are not separated, you will never know me as God Almighty. And then other nine times is in the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation is all about separation. Get separated, get separated, get separated. Because the day of God is coming and he wants to reveal us. He wants to feed us with his flesh and with bread. And from the anointing that flows. And he wants to take us to Zarephath where he can refine us. And bring life back of God into the church. So that we can be all partakers of the Elijah ministry. Everyone sitting here can be partakers of the Elijah ministry and be part of that ministry. But it doesn't stop there. Before Elijah can go deal with the real big enemy, he has to be prepared. Even Elijah has to be prepared in Zarephah. And I believe many of you, many of us are being prepared at Zarephah for the final battle. He's refining us. He's refining us. Zarephath was the city where the smelting of metals took place. It was famous for that. So the term Zarephath itself means refining. Unless you are refined at Zarephath, if you want to skirt Zarephath, you can go to the next point. The next point, Elijah is moved from Zarephath east to Carmel. And Carmel means the Lord's vineyard. You want to go into the Lord's vineyard, you cannot skirt Zarephath. Unless you are refined, you cannot be there in the Lord's vineyard. To be a laborer, a co-laborer, a worker with Christ in the Lord's vineyard, you have to go through Zarephath. The next command that comes to Elijah is to go to Carmel. 
Once his work at Zarephath is complete, when your refining by God is complete, he will move you to the next level and says, fine, now you are ready. You are ready now. Move to Carmel. Move to Carmel and meet Ahab face to face. Call him face to face and tell him to bring the 450 prophets of Baal. 450 prophets of Baal. You know what Baal means? Baal is a Canaanite god. But you know what Baal means? Baal means god of plenty. Are you hearing about the god of plenty from pulpits day in and day out? Baal means the god of prosperity. Baal means the god of plenty. Baal means the god of fertility. And God is telling the Elijah ministry, I want you to go to my vineyard and confront the false prophets of Baal. So that my people can be restored. 450 of them are there. There's only one Elijah. God is telling Elijah, go there and confront them. Go there and confront them. And when Elijah comes over there, scripture says, the people had nothing to say. They kept quiet. And God is asking us, are you keeping quiet? Do you have an opinion? We need to have an opinion. There are many who have an opinion for the enemy, some who have an opinion for God, and a majority who have no opinion. Which category do you fall? Verse 21 of chapter 18. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. So can we at least have a hallelujah over here? Hallelujah. So I can't say Lord, they didn't say a word. They said hallelujah. <laughs> Man. So you have an opinion. But the people there had no opinion. But before the prophets of Baal can be dealt with, Elijah is looking for 12 stones. Before the prophets of Baal could be looked for, tackled, God looked in Jacob for 12 sons. Before the world could be tackled by the gospel, Jesus looked for 12 disciples. He represents the spiritual Israel and the spiritual church. Elijah took 12 stones. Did you see that? He took 12 stones. We come to chapter 18 and verse 31. Elijah said to all the people, verse 30, come near to me. So all the people came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. In the Lord's vineyard called Carmel, the Lord's altar is broken down. So he picks up 12 stones and he starts repairing. You and I cannot fight the God of this world until the altar is repaired. The altar has to be repaired. And you know what? After the altar is repaired, he does something. Verse 32. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar. Next thing he did. He built an altar. Then he dug a trench around the altar. He is telling the people. Now that you have built, repaired yourself with God. Now make a separation from the world. Make a separation from the world. Make a separation from the world. And then on the altar, there are certain things that need to be put. He says, verse 33, he put the wood in order. He put the wood in order. And on top of the wood, what did he put? He put the bull. And then he says, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. Do it a second time and do it a third time. So how many pots of water did he pour? Twelve pots of water for each of the stones. Everyone personally needs to be immersed in the water of God. It's not one pot of water for twelve stones. It's one pot of water for each stone. Before you can be used and sanctified by God. Each one has to be immersed in the water of God. And on the top is the wood. And on the wood is the bull. The wood represents 
the self. Sorry, the wood represents the flesh and the bull represents the flesh. Everything has to be put on the altar. Your flesh and yourself has to be there on the altar, immersed with water. And the water now flows into the trench, meaning you and I can have an artificial separation from the world. It doesn't work unless that separation is anointed by the word of God. If it is not anointed and covered by the word, we'll always cross that separation and go back. Why have you done this, brother? Because it is written. You should know why you have separated from. Because it is written. Why don't you do this anymore? Because it is written. Many people have made just rules. And those rules are just from man. It's just a trench. But what happens? Because there is no water, when the times change, they just cross over the trench and go back to the world. And God says, the trench is dug by man, but the water comes from God. The word comes from God. There has to be a separation, which is my part of digging the trench, and it is based on God's word. And on this altar is put the wood and the flesh. And there is water all around. And you know what? There is also something else over there. Before you can expect the fire of God to come upon your life, you need to pour water on your sacrifice. You know what that means? What have they been having for three and a half years? What is Israel going through for the past three and a half years? Famine. What is that? Famine. 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 Drought. What, do, what is that they don't have? What is the most expensive commodity in Israel? Water. What is that God has asked them to pour? Water. What is most important in your life? Put it on the altar. Put it on the altar. What is most important in your life? God says, put it on the altar. Maybe a person, it may be a career, it may be a job, it can be a child, it can be anything. God says, put it on the altar. Pour it. That. And you know what Paul says? I am poured like a drink offering before the Lord. You know why the anointing rested upon that man? Because he says, here, I am poured out like an offering before God. And Romans 12, 1, God says, offer yourselves, your bodies, as living sacrifices. You need to look at what Elijah is doing and you need to look at what we need to do. The spiritual aspect of it, God says, put it. So out there is, if you look from above, you will see the self, the flesh, the altar that is built, covered with water, and the only thing left is fire to come. And when fire comes, the first thing, the fire falls on the flesh. And scripture says, the works of the flesh, your work shall be tested with fire. On that day, on that day, your work shall be tested by fire. The first thing that is consumed is the self. The next thing that is consumed is your flesh goes. The next thing that is consumed is the stones. They are no longer dead stones. In fire they become living stones. One Peter will say, you are living stones on which God is building his church. And next thing you see, the whole of the water, and not only the whole of the water, even the dust itself is consumed. That is called translation. In the twinkling of an eye, everything will be consumed by the fire of God and the incorruptible will become, the corruptible will become the incorruptible. That's what Elijah is doing on Mount Carmel. He says there is a day when God's fire is going to come. When God's fire falls upon, everything in you will be consumed. All that will be left is the God in you. All that will be left is the God in you. And that's what happens over there. All that is left is the God in us. We have no testimony. We have no name. We have only one name. It's better to die to that name now. Rather than he destroyed then our names. Because in the book of Revelation, he says, I shall give you a new name. I shall give you a new name. I shall give you a new robe. I shall give you a new robe. If you have a robe given by your father, your mother, your family, God says, it will be taken away. If you have a robe which has been given by your employer and you are very happy about it, that also will be taken away. Joseph had a robe given by his father and he was very proud about it. One day it was torn away from him. 
Then he had another robe which was given to him by his master. One day it was torn away by him from him by the master's wife. And all he had was a name which couldn't be uttered. But one day he stood before the Pharaoh and he said, Pharaoh is like God to me. And the Pharaoh put a new robe over him and gave him a new name. And the book of Revelation says, all that you have built of yourself will be taken away and God will give us a new robe and a new name. That's when the fire of God falls. That's when the fire of God calls. We will realize I have no testimony. I have no history. It is his story, not history. It is all about him. It was all about him. So let it be all about him right now. Then you will have a large story when he speaks about you. And that's what happens there when the fire of God falls upon the altar. Everything is burnt and consumed. That's the picture we will see in the new covenant which is called translation. And translation takes place. But what does Elijah say? Elijah says something to the man of flesh who is standing over there. He tells him something. <coughs> Verse 41, 18, verse 41, chapter 18. Elijah said to Ahab, go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. There is the sound of abundance of rain, Ahab, go, eat and drink. And what does Ahab go? Does he get into his chariot and he goes to eat and drink. And Jesus said in the last days, it will be like in the days of Noah, when the latter rain is coming and judgment is coming, people will be still eating and drinking. And the Ahabs of this world, in spite of the miracle and the fire of God falling there in their eyes, will still go back to the world and still continue to eat and drink. Yet the man of God puts his head down between his knees and doesn't raise his head because he's waiting for the latter rain. And God is asking us, as God's people, there, what is your position? Are you running with Rahab eating the drink and the food of this world or are you there on your knees waiting for the latter rain? Because there is the sound of abundance of rain. There is the sound of abundance of rain. Elijah doesn't rise. There is a servant mentioned over there but he has no name. Because he never completed that journey. Because that servant is not Elisha. That servant is never mentioned again in the Bible. After this he meets Elisha. He tells him go. He goes. He sees nothing and comes back. He says go again. He goes and comes back. Seven times he goes. When you haven't followed Elijah closely, he will not see anything. He will not see anything. Elisha saw. This servant saw nothing. It's only in the seventh visit he saw. And he saw a little hand rising. When the double portion of the anointing comes, the sea over the waters, it will come over the humanity, it will come like a little hand, this anointing of God is rising. God will raise up the hand ministry back again, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists and the pastors who will remain faithful to him and their hand will rise over the multitudes and there will be the sound of the abundance of rain. He will restore back, he will restore back into the ministry a set of people who have been refined by his fire. To the world it will look like a tiny little hand. A tiny, they will not notice. The hand will get louder and bigger and you will hear the sound of the latter rain coming. But I am telling you, it's not going to happen now. It's going to happen in the seventh year. The seventh time. That's when restoration begins. 6,000 years of man's history is coming to an end. The seventh year, the 7,000 of God's restoration is about to begin. That's when the hand will arise. That is when the hand will arise and Elijah ministry will cease and the Elisha ministry will begin. The double portion anointing ministry will begin and God says, each one of you sitting here can be part of that. You can be part of that ministry if you, like Elijah, will not take your eyes off. Like Elisha, will not take your eyes off Elijah. Will you say, my God, my Jehovah. My God, my Jehovah. My God is Jehovah. Will you follow me till the end? That's why people don't actually read the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is all about overcomers and nothing about the others. It's only about overcomers, 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 overcomers are who will follow till the end. 
You may fall hundred times, you'll get up still and continue walking with him. Continue walking with him. Continue walking and you are not walking with him, seeking anything from him. Lord, there is only one thing I desire. I desire the anointing. When Elijah was taken away, Elisha received a double portion of this anointing. If Elijah did seven miracles in the Bible, Elisha did fourteen. When John the Baptist came in the power of the Holy Ghost and preached the gospel of repentance, the one who came after him was filled without measure, that was Jesus. And then when Elijah comes in the last days, the one who comes, ones who come after him will have a double portion of that anointing. And they are called the sons of God. And whole of creation groaned for the sons of God to be revealed. Scripture says. They are all waiting. Because this is all that happened is nothing compared to what is going to happen now. And Jesus said, greater work than what I have done is going to be done. He said, this is nothing. You are looking at all my miracles. He said, you have no idea what is going to happen. Because instead of one Jesus, there will be so many sons of God who have followed Jesus and died to themselves. And Lord will have a testimony on earth. A people who died and lived for God. That's the call. Just that is the call. It's like a rich man. A rich man who looked at every, all the poor children and said, I'm opening a school. And he opened a school and said, everything is free over here. Come. Only thing, one thing I ask of you. You have to change your clothes and come in uniform. And I will provide you the uniform. And that is salvation. You should feast? No. Teachers will come and teach you. Do you have to do anything? Nothing. Just come in. Only thing, one thing. At the gate, change your uniform. Take care of your clothes stained by sin. And the rich man will give you a new uniform. Robes of righteousness. But once you get into school, you need to pass. You need to work hard. <laughs> you need to pass. You need to work hard. You need a rank. You need to work even more. You need to top in your class. You need to work even more. Once you get into the kingdom, it's free. You can't do anything. Only there's a change of uniform at the door. Everything else God says, follow, obey, cut, circumcise, 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 circumcise. Don't get distracted by the things of the world. You are running a race. And there is an anointing and a position that is reserved for God's people. And he says, don't lose it. Don't lose it. That is the history of Israel. The history of Israel was that 600,000 men and women came out. Only three were approved by God. Moses, a Joshua and a Caleb. Only three were approved. All the others, did you come out of Egypt into the school? Yes. Did you change your uniform? Yes. Were you approved? No. You were not approved. You need to realize that is the truth of the word. It hasn't changed. It's still the same. And God is calling us. God is calling us to give us the Elijah mantle. And he's telling us this morning, destroy the balls in your, in your household. It's only a people who have bowed down at the fire that comes, who are on their face before God and say, Jehovah is God, will rise up and then go kill the balls. Then when Elijah says, go, take your sword and kill all the balls, they get up and go kill the same balls to whom they were listening all these years. You have to kill every false doctrine, every false prophet in your life. Kill them. Kill them. Don't listen to them anymore. Kill it. Kill it. Kill it. Get up. Arise. But before you can get up to kill, you should be on your face before God. The people were on their face before God and they cried out, Jehovah is God. What were they saying? They were saying, Elijah. What were they saying? Do you know what they said? They said, Jehovah is God. You know what they said? They said, Elijah. God is Jehovah. That's what they said. And then they got up and killed the Baals. And God is calling us. Get up and kill the Baals in your life. Kill the gods of this world in your life. Don't get upset and worried and anxiety ridden about all what tomorrow will hold. God says, don't worry. You are still being refined. You have moved from chariot to Zarephath. Have you reached Carmel? If we haven't reached Carmel, we have missed out on God's calling. The calling is to come to Carmel. Carmel is God's vineyard. Who wants to be there all life in Zarephat? What are you being doing? I'm being refined, brother. How long will you be refined? I don't know, brother. I'm still going through the furnace, brother. When can God ever use you in his vineyard? When can God use you to, to, to handle the gods of this world? God says, come. We're coming to the table today. It's the table 
not just of salvation, this table of God's power. Power comes from this. The power comes from this. You need to realize the power comes from this. If he hadn't died, he would have been a people without hope. Forget salvation. There's no overcoming. But now that you are saved, and now that so many of you have got baptized, and so many are still waiting to get baptized, there is no waiting to get baptized. <coughs> Even a eunuch knows that. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? Well, you showed me the water is there. What is there to waste? Stop me. I said, nothing to stop. Come. Let's get baptized. There are some still waiting to get baptized. And baptism is only after the beginning of Elijah's ministry. Elijah calls you to repentance. From repentance comes salvation. And after salvation comes baptism. Amen?